Welcome back to Not Aliens. We are with Jennifer Dale. Now, all archaeology is within our grasp. That's not a, yeah, that's not like us, <laughs> no pressure, right? No pressure at all. <laughs> uh, and we're going to start with an easy one. Just the, uh, everyone who's listening, I'm sure knows that you and I have been on other shows together. We have done stuff on conflict. Uh, we've chatted. We've been meaning to do this together for Not Aliens for a long time. But the reality is that we have been uh, planning an expedition to South America. We have something maybe on the boards for New England. Uh, and now, most importantly, is to finally start unpacking a lot of the archaeology and our ancient megalithic history, which is so literally megalithic. So, how you doing? Again, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, not. And Sardinia is just a small little, you know, just a, f a speck in the world history, and yet. Uh, that's how everyone would like it to uh, be. And for everyone listening, we are going to be unpacking this ridiculous area, Malta, the area of the, uh, well, a lot of people like to get stuck with Greek and Roman history. The reality is that there is so much megalithic history, not underground. And it includes something that I'm writing about now in my second book, and it's about rock cut ruins. And so we are going to do this screen share and look at these um, uh, ruins. And so, Jennifer, where do you want to start? Let's start in the, at the beginning. Let's start um, in the Paleolithic in Sardinia. And just for, you know, the folks that are, are tuned in, Sardinia is in the Mediterranean just below Corsica. So um, think in terms of you know, it being the southernmost island of Italy or the, sudden, the southernmost uh, portion of Italy. Um, so the Paleolithic in Sardinia is, I find fascinating just because it is a period of between 450,000 years and 10,000 years ago. So um, according to researchers, there was an early hominid there. Um, they call him or her, Nor, um, and you are, which was uh, what they believe the first human-like or hominid uh, creature to inhabit this area or colonize this area. Um, it was identified in the Lower Paleolithic, which is about 250,000 years ago. So I'm telling you this because it's really important to understand that this island or this area has been occupied for a very long time. Um, and believe it or not, Corsica and Sardinia used to be linked. I think it was uh, off the top of my brain, the um, ocean was about 130 meters less than what it is now. So there was quite a bit more land associated with this, this island in particular. Yeah, and about what time period? For, well, because we have Dogger land in Ireland and Scotland to France, and even 4,000 years ago, a good chunk of Dogger land was still above water. And then at 6,000 years ago, it's exponential. And by God, at 8,000 years, all of Dogger land is almost still there. And they, exactly. that's, that's all mainstream. And my map, and I, 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 it's not even about the book, but I, I painstakingly worked with a, an, an arch, arch, uh, architect, engineer, and uh, illustrator to come up with a map of the world that would include the city off the coast of Cuba that's, 50, you know, it, again, it, it's 2,300 feet deep. And this is based on what you're saying, almost 400 feet deep for those who are calculating meters and, and assorted other numbers. <laughs> but the Mediterranean looked like a lake. The Baltic Sea was a lake. The Caribbean. They're spot on. Yeah, they were a lake. And so we're not talking tens of hundreds of thousands of Neolithic Paleo years ago. Uh, if Doggerland looked like it did, why wouldn't, why wouldn't this island and the surrounding area be also at six to 15,000 years ago? Again, pre-Younger Dryas, but it's pretty clear that what we're looking at are the, is the high ground, right? That's, pretty much. Uh, run, 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 run. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. I, I, I think pulled, what, 
I pulled the go map ahead. up. Yeah, yeah. Did you want to say anything about the map before I go back to the other no. photos? No, that's good. It, good context. So um, I think I think what's interesting about this as well is that um, why I find islands interesting is because the folks that tend to live on islands tend to be extremely adaptable, um, meaning that they they adapt to their environments, which are often perhaps less. Um, Hospitable? Less, yeah, less hospitable and filled with resources. And they tend to make do with things. So you see really interesting adaptations. Um, that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to work in Sardinia. So I should say that too. I worked in Sardinia. I worked there um, when I got done with my undergraduate work. Um, and I had a really nice stipend with uh, Penn State when I was able to work there. So Sardinia has a, a near and dear place in my heart, as well as um, I am, I have a quarter of Sardinian in me. So um, my genetics trace back to that area as well. So um, I've got a bit of a vested interest, I guess you could say. Um, I think, so we're talking about continuous um, activity on the island, which is rarely talked about. And I think it's important in context, especially when looking at, you know, these rock cut tombs, tombs in quotation marks, um, these rock cut areas. Um, and reason being is because they're, you know, they have um, systems involved in these where they have excellent uh, ventilation shafts in a number of them, as well as the interiors of them are um, created to almost look like their houses or structures of some sort. So I, I think that that's just a really important to point to put in here as people are looking at them. They're made as if there are windows in them so that people could look out. And there are areas where um, they have drainage systems involved. And you know, if, if you're watching, then you might actually think, oh, Daranuku, or think of some of these other subterranean um, uh, I don't even know what you call them, structures that exist throughout the world. Well, I know things that can be adapted or they can, you know, people take on different things based on different needs um, at different times. I do think that there is a, a collective consciousness that exists. So just to bring yeah. that up. Oh, I, it's been, I've been talking about that a lot lately, uh, especially with the dangers of, again, we're, we're actively using, everyone keeps saying 10 to 15%. And the problem is that there is a collective human consciousness. It's been proven a lot of different ways, but at the same time, people devalue these tribal areas or uh, more native peoples and places that are like, oh, well, this person's life is expendable because, well, all they do is bang rocks. And I've been trying to make an argument lately, not even an argument, I'm trying to bring people aware of that even if you're part of a, a very powerful system or if you make a lot of money, the issue isn't uh, that you, you know, you're devaluing people that you think don't contribute to your uh, high lifestyle and your advanced technology. The issue is collective human consciousness, I think is part of that memory system. It's part of the RAM that inspires and is part of the download process when you're deciding how to create the new graphing conductor for your spintronics for your quantum computer. That's, I've been chatting about that, that again, we had maybe a half a billion people on the planet, they think when Leonardo was around and he thought of a corkscrew with wood and guys spinning on it. It's not, and then, and then the lineal argument is, well, you know, you just build on five guys' ideas every 100 years. Well, that's not true. Collectively, exponentially our ideas and our inventions in a hundred years have expanded. And I don't think it's a, a, a relevance of just our base math and technology. I think it's a matter of also the amount of human collective RAM irrelevant to whether you're in a jungle or if you're in a city and irrelevant to whether or not you're a scientist, the 8 billion people are adding to that, that wavelength, that human RAM necessity to, to complete complex problems. I mean, there's even theories about how even your own memories and your own consciousness are not stored within your own body. Like the whole Carillion uh, photography or Burr's work from 1940s showing that whether it's an unfertilized seed or if it's a uh, unfertilized egg, that the magnetic pattern shows that of the adult 
organism that it's going to turn into. That work was already realized in the 1940s. And that's mainstream that this magnetic signature of whatever you're going to grow into, it already exists. So the whole idea of a wave and frequency based uh, vibrational medicine, what we are, who we are now today is not a system that is to be, I think, taken lightly where we suddenly say, well, 33% of the human population is expendable. Uh, time out. I, yeah. I, uh, granted, I don't think people should be killed for being gay, marrying the wrong tribe. Uh, the ridiculousness of burning people at the stake still for being witches and sorcerers. I mean, this is a thing. This is, this is the world we live in. This is not fiction. And, and, and who you marry and what you do, I'm just saying it is bizarre that we actually live in a world where, again, uh, life, people, consciousness, forget consciousness is such a low item on the list of, hey, everyone's valuable. Well, that's a cliche. Well, it isn't, but okay. I, think it's an, I think it's an important point. I just wanted to back you up on that. I Thank hope. you. Um, I would even add in there, I believe having worked in Sardinia and just uh, as a, a general aside to that as well, I think that uh, telluric fields and energetic fields, magnetic fields in the earth are definitely a part of that collective consciousness as well. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah, absolutely agree. There's no way it connects otherwise. It's all magnetic. It's all, everything Ken Wheeler's work is talking about, it's all connected. Yeah. And there's, um, Maria Wheatley does really interesting work with telluric fields and dowsing. Um, and she's out of uh, the UK. I'm going to Malta with her come hell or high water in October. Nice. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I, I think that there's this whole idea, it's kind of just been lost to all of us because, you know, I, to use a cliche, Graham Hancock, Graham Hancock we're a, a species with amnesia. Totally true. Um, we've forgotten how to check into that level of consciousness because we've gotten so far away from it. And, um, Again, and I, uh, what that means, I don't know, and I can't give a, you know, a descriptor of what that is, but I do believe it exists, especially at a number of these sites, um, whether or not they're, you know, turned on or that they're operating the way that they're supposed to be. I don't know that because I, you know, it's lost to me as well, but I'm trying to discover it. When right. I go to these places, my goal is, is to you know, what's going on here? What's the context? Where does it, where does it exist in a map, on a map? How do I understand, you know, ley lines and the signatures that exist within those ley lines? How can I identify those? How can I find someone that can identify those importantly? You know, um, I think those are the questions as researchers that we should be asking ourselves because those are the things that might actually tell us about these unknown um, technologies that existed within these civilizations. There are things that we no longer value um, or they've just been lost to us and we have no idea that we should value them. On, on, on that note, uh, on the idea that that connectivity, I've been going on lately about the piezoelectric properties of engineered soil of Terra Preta and other biochars that are and it's occurred to me all along, I keep giving people the example that if we have, there are two things. One is you have people saying randomly, they have no context. Let's reduce the human population because there's too many people. If you took everyone, I credit Michael Tellinger with this. You, you give everybody an acre and everybody could fit in basically two Texases or basically two South Americas or South Africa's. You know, that's not a lot of land to give everybody an acre. Fine, give everybody a road to their favorite shopping mall, and now they take up the southern half of Africa. But that's it. The entire world is not populated, but we have engineered soil all over the planet and biochars that were made by someone that also have the curious prop the, the capabilities of filtering carbon dioxide. So... It hit me, ironically, despite me saying I'm a fan of aeroponics, and, yeah. I, and you know, I've talked about it, and the idea of just aerosoling micro-atomized water with the correct number of nutrients, not 15 or 16, but like 
50 or 60 nutrients to a plant to make them super nutrient rich in order to grow plants that, and then I, I point out 3D printers, bio 3D printers, but we'll be printing food in kind of a Star trek -y way soon. And then it hit me, hold on, I bring this up because these are the things that people could do, including to make gold in the ancient past, if they had giant, if they had machines that were more advanced. It finally hit me that the whole point of piezoelectric engineered soil has nothing to do with having uh, irrelevant if there was hundreds of billions of people on the planet. It had nothing to do with growing soil. It has to do with the fact that all over the earth are these polygonal masonry ruins as if everybody and everything using that third eye that wasn't a theory, but an actual connected, whether it's that synesthesia, whether it's walking on the ground, meant that everybody and the buildings and everything around them, right down to the plants, that vibrational energy, that was all connected. The greatest cures in homeopathy I've been talking about lately are ones where they're diluted to where the water itself is basically holding the vibrational pattern of the original plant or essential oil that was within it, that if you dilute it down. Well, I've been talking more about the fact that if you were just walking by those very plants that had that vibrational signature, is there a point where through the soil itself, we were just connected that way? I know we're getting far away from polygonal masonry on the island. But back to it, it's here you have, a, even just for everybody to get an idea, this is one of these places that's been consistently credited, like you said, being occupied, but it's considered central to the world because it's near Greece. Mm -hmm. It's near the Minotians. It's near the Etruscans. It's near the Greeks. So it's always given credit for being a very Western foundational, uh, when people think of history, they think, oh, well, it wasn't there when Sumeria was there. On that note, what do you have to say about this giant megalithic construction? That, that, is, that is a narage. So these are really interesting, these conical structures that have been built. Some would say, why did they build them to look like cones? Or what, what would be the utility or purpose of that? Um, and just to even say a little bit about the Neurogic culture, um, they believe that the Neurogic people were a matrilineal culture, which means that they were governed by women, which yep. is almost kind of unheard of. As not necessarily in the Mediterranean, because we have the Minoans, where we know that women held office and stuff like that. Um, this was also a clan-based group, um, very, very family-oriented, still even to this day. Um, I think that these are, so they would have the Naragi in the central location, and then small circular huts outside in the Naragic villages. Um, this is, you're going to laugh, Jared, this is considered a ceremonial structure oh yeah my favorite <laughs> that's all anybody had time for ceremony you know, i i would say maybe some ceremonial stuff was going on in here but i would say this is more of a meeting structure where the leaders within the clan based group would meet up it was also a point where they could look out they would go up on top of these they would have kind of a corbelled ceiling on top with a hole in the center you could have a fire inside if you needed to but i would say that they also use these for lookouts um yeah. a number of them are modified to be forts um we know that the i think that uh there are over seven thousand narages on the island which is seven thousand of these and those are the ones that you can still see um there are a number that are just gone because the stones have been repurposed. Right. Um, Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, they're, you know, they're also considered, they could have been used for storage. They probably were later in time, especially by, by more modern uh, people. So, you know, there are any number of things that you can say about these Naragis. Um, they are literally everywhere. Every town that you go into usually has at least one, if not like five. Because <laughs> this do is you not think, a big island. So uh, in giving people a history, you know, you sit down in class, people want to hear about what we know of 
in our sciences, but isn't it interesting? I got this one up on the right and the blocks look polygonal. They look like yeah. they've been. So what's interesting to me about these, and I've seen other shows and we haven't gotten to them yet where the, they're still intact and you can still see up inside them. And I, I guess I should look for one. Uh, but as far as these go, is it interesting to you that they seem to be polygonal blocks that have been either restacked or completely, completely weathered? Or do you think it's both? That's a great question. I mean, like even just that one that you're looking at right now, Naragelosa, um, I think that that's one of the older Narage on the island, or they've identified as an older. What you see on top, the stuff that doesn't have the lichen on it, is yeah. been rebuilt. That's yeah. that's a rebuilding. But what you see on the bottom is existing. That's that's real, and that's actually what it looked like. We know um, just from the geological information of the island, this island has been hit by tsunamis multiple times. So the fact that these things are still standing is kind of amazing in and of itself. So the weathering that you see on these, I mean, they're made of, um, some are made of limestone, some are made of, are, are made of uh, like a volcanic basalt. Um, there, you know, there, there's a vast, yeah, that one right there, I was just thinking of that one. Um, that one is, Trying to think where that one is. I think that's closer to uh, the coast, the green, the the Emerald Coast, I believe. It, um, it looks, yeah, it looks like it's stacked, but it doesn't look like that's. Again, I'm just thinking of it as a builder, as a guy who's yeah. been doing construction for so many years. It just looks like it's restacked stuff, exactly like secondary cultures in Peru yep. that have grabbed polygonal blocks and they've restacked the original blocks. I, I would agree with that. I think, um, you know, the neurogic culture didn't show up until six to 7,000 years ago. I think they're considered a, a Neolithic culture um, because or Calvolithic. Yeah, because it's just not, because some of the blocks look very polygonal and similar, like they stack them from a, a similar uh, what, whatever was left, whatever was broken, whatever yeah. was left. Well, and you'll see like lintel stones too, the, the stones that they put up on top of, you know, a number of the doorways, the entryways, they're often broken in half. And I think, like I think that one. the, yeah. Well, this one's intact. Yeah, that one's intact. But as we go through and we start talking about the Tomba Giganti, um, the giant's tombs, you know, those big headstones that have been carved out. Um, yep then you'll start to see some of the more um, megalithic buildings and some of the, it just changes. You can tell that they're different. You know what I mean? They're associated, but they don't seem like they should fit quite in the same um, category, I would say. So, I mean, should we take a look at those now? Is that going to sure. be more like, yeah. like this? Yep. Those are the Tomba Giganti. And so, what we know about these, um, there are a couple, there are two types of tombs on the island. So we have these, and these are basically um, the slab tombs. And just like it sounds, they're very large. They've been, you know, chiseled out. Um, they're called Tomba Giganti because of their sheer size, which I guess makes sense. Um, but there's also a lot of lore about um, giants on the island as well. You have that tiny little entrance hole at the bottom. Yeah. So a, a lot of people feel confused by these. Well, how did they put people in there? What, what was really going on? We don't really know. We think that they were interring ashes into these. But if you look on the back, yeah, exactly. It's, it's more of like a uh, it's more like a, a tomb that you would see like maybe um, in Ireland or, you know, in the UK, yeah. that, that back portion of it. Um, they're, they're pretty much everywhere. Um, you see them all over the place. They do have that kind of half moon shape, crescent shape to them. Um, and they're almost all made out of that really heavy... Um, it's a it's a limestone, but it's also almost like it's been heated or something. Uh, almost not like a vitrification, but it's almost like it. It doesn't seem quite like the limestone that you see in other places around the island. 
All right, let me ask you this. I'm looking at this picture of it. You could tell from some of the other pictures that, let me go back to this one. It, it, looks, like it's car, it looks like it's carved over, right? Like it's going yeah. this way. Like you said, whether they melted it or, or shaped it that way. But it makes me wonder when I, whenever I'm looking at, again, only 120 year old remodeling, but well, in looking at this stuff for as long as I've looked at it, the, the way it's bent back, yeah. it, it almost seems like at some point that, because uh, to, to me, the back of this tomb right here, mm-hmm. that, that looks like restack. You can see all the large megalithic blocks ac- down the center. And then you have the thin, more like it almost looks polygonal on the sides. But to me, it, uh, the, my wondering is, here's my question. Let's see if I can get back to it. My question is, is it possible that the way that this is curved and the way it's set, in reality, they just took the blocks from this, they got the idea of doing these towers from uh, what was in ruins, these tombs, and that these tombs uh, weren't tombs. I mean, they were constructions. I mean, these, these are large megalithic blocks. You don't, you don't go from shaping stones like this to using small blocks. Yeah. And granted, yeah, we're, we're not looking at small blocks, by the way, for everyone looking. I mean, what is, do you know what some of the tonnage is on some of yeah, those? Yeah, this one that you're looking at right now is um, 13 feet and uh, 13 feet tall. And uh, let's see, it is, it rises 13 feet and it is six feet across. Um, and it is, I believe this one is three, two tons between almost three tons right in there. And that's just the one, that's the entrance, right? Yeah. Well then what about, and I'm referring for people in the back to the, uh, the megalithic blocks that are holding up the ceiling of the tomb in the back mm-hmm. behind it. It, it doesn't appear to be, uh, it doesn't appear to be a, a tomb, you know, it just, whatever but either way it's a restack because the blocks that make the ceiling in the back are massive megalithic blocks yeah. again it always it always seems like something that ends up as a standing stone ends up as the sea or you know it's a again any one of these if you if you knock down every other one you now have standing stones but yeah. i i see walls to a building that have weathered so tremendously that all that's left is one course one block row but to, to us, it looks like, okay, well, it's curving in as we stand in the front of this little tiny entrance. It looks like it's curving in. So it, was there an original, was this originally an interior space is my question is why is this an exterior space? Yeah. At, I mean, Which entirely side is the possible. End? The other thing is, is we see these standing stones just like this, like the, the, I don't even know what to call it, that main block with the tiny yeah. little door. We see these all over um, Eastern Europe. Uh, I believe that they've had some in Russia. We, we see them in so many different places. These, uh, these types of tomb tumuli are not just from Sardinia. Um, so I find that interesting. I, I, I think that that's an interesting correlation to have just this commonality, you know, more of that collective consciousness. What, what were these all about? Some of, and they have that tiny little door, they call it a fairy door. Um, and yeah. the, the lore around it is that um, you have, uh, you know, the spirit of said person can come out and visit the, the person who is still amongst us in the living um, so that they get to still have, you know, a, a relationship essentially. Uh, collect them all <laughs> visit all your relatives <laughs> basically yeah <laughs> um, uh, but that what's interesting though is again it's a very well cut rock so my first question would be is if we were standing there in person how intricate does it seem uh, yeah the photos don't really do justice to how fine they are the other thing i'll say is when you go to sardinia at least when i was there you have access to all of this. You can touch it, climb on it. I mean, which just seems so strange to me, given you know that these are fragile 
or perceived as fragile, you know, things, people are really respectful of them. Um, I, I can't imagine, like the, the one at the top that you just showed with those, that very large lintel over, overhead, um, there's a lot of blocks everywhere all over the island. This island is interesting because it has, it had volcanic activity. Um, so it was actually part, in, part of an obsidian trade prehistorically. Um, they, I guess uh, there's a, a, an, uh, a village called Oristano and they have some of the finest obsidian coming out of them. So it, it's not entirely shocking to me that they would rework old pieces of stone that maybe got knocked down by a tsunami or, you know, something cataclysmic happened, that they would try and put things back together, I guess is it, what it I'm totally, trying to say. I, I, and for those that don't know this, and this is what's so frustrating is to see, um, this, this is, uh, in looking at this picture, this giant's tomb, that is not the original construction. You can see the large megalithic blocks you can see smaller stones that were clearly part of another section, a wall, a, a, a tape. I mean, uh, anything other than these, these megalithic blocks that are side by side look like original wall pieces to something. But then these lentils look like dolmens. I yeah. mean, they look like, but they're, but they're restacks. It's that, that, those large stones were not cut. This is not original in situ. This is not how this building looked. This is not, to me, original work. It's, it's a collabor. It's a, it's a, just a hodgepodge of stuff they found and restacked. No one builds like this. No one just takes really complex, well-cut stones. Well, the other thing is the antiquity of the weathering to the right in the photo uh, over where there's uh, the gap, mm -hmm. there was no there was no gap there. That would have well, been. Well, you can you can even see like that indentation on the lower part of the stone, and even yes. on the other stone on the other side, you can see where there was actually. Yep, exactly. Yep. And the lichen growth. I mean, it's been standing up there for a while, but some of these yeah. stones, when you look at the lichen growth and all of the patina on the stones, it doesn't make sense based on their current exposure. I'll definitely, yeah, I've, I've it, seen a lot of that there. You know, it does, and I do think a lot of stuff like uh, the theories of Stonehenge being a restacking of those lentil pieces, and, and Stonehenge isn't even in its original context, but if the stones were moved, you know, someplace like this, particularly this place, or Malta, it would be interesting to tilt one of these things and get some OSL dating uh, off the bottom because I think some of these large pieces were never moved. I think they went to where some of the ones were and didn't remove them. But it does make me wonder about the smaller pieces, if they were in a higher portion of a construction, if they weren't faced with a detail or a design or ultimately fell apart. And what we're really looking at are, we're looking at two extremes. We're looking at the very tops and the very bottoms of prior buildings that were much more complex. And then whether tsunami or otherwise, the middle sections were what blown away or destroyed uh, to the point where all that we have is this rubble. But the, the basis of these constructions, and here's the other thing that like here, uh, this is another one. Again, there's a lentil, there's a small door, but again, it's the size and shape of the blocks. If we compare this to the Temple of Delphi, I, again, that's still a polygonal wall, almost still in place. Here we have polygonal blocks, megalithic blocks, very well and precisioned weather to extreme antiquity. And we can't date, I wish we could date. I don't know why, why can't we date them yet? Why can't we date lichen? Why can't we just figure out how long it takes for those little buggers to give birth and just like, you know, your crusty great, 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 great times a thousand grandfather is the one of the lowest where, you know, we got the uh, dental pick and we're, you know, he's petrified yeah. now. Why can't we figure that out? You know, I do think, I know that they do some patina dating in um, the desert Southwest. And I know that it's, it's somewhat problematic based on, you know, uh, exposure to different types of uh, radioactivity, especially yeah. in the desert Southwest. I, I don't yeah. know if they, 
I don't know if they've used anything like that here. That, that's a really great question and something to write down and to, I can look into that and see if they have. I don't know if they have, but it's a really I, good question. Well, thanks. I've been asking, I've been thinking about it for a long time, but I know that from my asking also, it's not something that's been answerable. Yeah. Uh, wait, this isn't there. Is that, is this there? Uh, I think that is there. Yeah. But I think oh. that's a natural, I think that's a natural, natural erosion unless the top of it, I can't see. Yeah, that's there. I, yeah. I've got a couple pictures of that one too. I, I think it's a really good segue into the, um, the rock cut tombs, which I think are mind blowing and do incorporate some megalithic stones in them. How much of this, like the photo that we're looking at, um, how much soil, like here, it's clearly buried. And yeah. I know I've seen other, some other investigators' videos. What's frustrating to me is all these rock cut underground areas you can walk up to and you can get into some of them, but apparently they're incredibly deep, they're incredibly extensive, and none of them are, are who, why isn't anyone digging these out? Well, I think that there are a couple of things. I think that they have somewhat been reclaimed by the people who live there. So, um, you know, if they're, if they have their goats out or if they're doing anything with their animals, they often will leave them in these cave structures and they no longer have any, um, they're just no longer intact because they've been used historically for exactly what I'm talking about. So are they deep? Yes, they're deep and they're full of uh, animal poop <laughs> is what the truth is. I mean, uh, they're just, they're no longer intact. People have fires and camp out in them. They sleep in them. Um, but it's so complex. Like you look at this doorway and you can see how well manufactured it was at one point. Yeah. And you can see that they at one point had like a wooden door frame on these structures. I mean, there are some that are so elaborate inside, they have just beautiful carvings. Um, they're, they're, you can see entire hillsides with just these rock cut tombs in them. Um, and like you said, they are so elaborately done. They're done so that they have a water source coming into them. There are springs that are right on the side of them. There, you could have rainfall collection in some of them. There are cisterns. There are some of the carvings that are in them. Um, they oftentimes reflect uh, Bullcrania. So you see the, the um, worship of bulls, which was very common in uh, Minoan times. Um, also in Anatolia. So you can see reflections of things that were going on in other places that somehow became important to this place. A lot of people, well, he's having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people ask, well, what did they, you'll see some that don't have like roof structures or anything on the top of them. Oftentimes right. this was covered with like vegetation, some sort of a grass. Um, on top of these for protection, some of them didn't have like a, a, a stone top to them. And I think that the other question that begs to be asked is, were these living structures and then turned into burial structures? Is this a secondary or maybe even a tertiary use of these structures? Um, and the reason I say that is because there's, there's this lore, this mythology that exists in Sardinia about um, fear of outsiders and fear of the water, fear of flooding and being inundated on a regular basis. And I think that there are a lot of answers to what happened prehistorically in mythology. There's always kernels of truth that exist yep. there. And you're looking at a group of people that have a, a pretty significant fear of bad things happening that come from the ocean, <laughs> whether that be pirates yeah. or cataclysmic events. I mean, like just this picture, you can see someone in a windowsill, it looks like, or a doorway. And you have modern construction and you have clearly a remnant rebuilt supporting wall. And then you have some either middle-aged or uh, uh, 1800s or whatever construction that's been maintained 
that has plaster on it, but underneath yet again, you see the ruins of what was left of some other structure and what looks like, oh, it's just natural boulders. Well, right down to the cobblestone road, all of these could have been from a prior construction that relates back to those megalithic, what are now tombs. And like you said, I think a lot of these necropolises where people are like, well, we know that the surface of the earth got really bad for a while. Yeah, so said every mythology and every legend of every tribe of every people. But then was it that those were necropolises or are all these rock cut underground cities also uh, containing a uh, group crew like living where they're living uh, in those, what, what we think is the Roman necropolis. And in reality, those were rock cut sleeping beds. Yeah. That's something we, we just assume, oh, those are tombs. And it's like, well, um, maybe they weren't. Because here, you know, looking at the, uh, the, the antiquity of it, the age it would take to get this to be what it is, is pretty, like this is a remnant of something. It's just, it is. It, how, how do you not, how do you not look at this and just wonder, I don't know, is it even safe to ask? All of this is extremely eye raising. I guess we haven't covered the statues yet, but is there anything on the island that really, really, really like sets, I mean, just, all of it is a tremendous mystery and worth investigation and completely amazing. But is there anything individually that just stands out where you're like, what the hell? I mean, I think for me personally, the thing that stands out is um, the continual, uh, well, the well, there's a well um, on the oh, island. Oh yeah. Yes. That the wells that are everywhere. Yeah, the wells stand out to me. And again, you know, it's an island in the middle of the ocean. So, of course, they really valued fresh drinking water. And I get that. But the construction. Not the lining. Yep, no way. That construction, the construction is crazy. The construction, the alignments um, blow my mind. It was that, there's it, one up a little bit. There's a circle. Um, down a little bit. There it is, right there. Ah. Up, right there. You got it. Um these wells and their orientations are just, um, they kind of blow your mind. You can, dr you can be driving along the road in Sardinia and they have these little, um, these little, uh, not grottos, that's not the right word, but these little areas where you can just stop, get a drink of water, and they have these little bronzettis or these statues of the Good Mother. Um, the Good Mother is, uh, throughout the island still highly worshipped identified probably closest to um the virgin mary but she she kind of uh she tops everyone there i'd say she's the preeminent uh uh i don't know goddess she's the preeminent one that still everyone's thanking and giving thanks to whether it's fertility or um just having a safe drive home from work the, the goddess is very, very active and alive on this island. And that was something I, I hadn't really gotten a grasp of it until years later I was there. Um, I have a beautiful little bronzetti and you see these little bronze statues all over the place. And even when you're excavating of the goddess, of uh, the good mother. I, I find that fascinating that, you know, it, it lived that long on this island because we see it in other places and she just kind of fades out and she's very alive here. The reason I bring that up is because there's almost always water associated with the goddess or any statuary or anything like this, um, which well, makes sense. What are the dates that they even, okay, let me just start with a less leading question. Who do they think Look, I mean, look at the construction of this, the staircase, the walls. It's crazy superb. Yeah. And I'm assuming in person it's even more interesting. Uh, what does it look like? Who, who do you think? Well, who are they saying built it and what do you actually think? I think that this is attributed to the Naraja culture. Um, I personally don't think it is because look at the construction of it look oh, how finished crazy. these stones are yeah because this is original so uh just yeah. for people to get an idea how many thousand year old is this supposed to be this is supposed to be six thousand years old this so is this, considered uh bronze age so the yeah okay so they <laughs> and what kind of stone is that 
I think that this is, uh, that looks like granite. Yeah, so uh, bronze works really good to shape granite, right? Yeah, as we found out in Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, the same people who did these finely hewn blocks and the mantles and what's left of this ruin uh, decided to just build up some rubble walls behind it, just some rubble up there. Yeah, That's some same protection. People. And, and I think that, uh, so what's, yes, they, there was probably a sanctuary built around this previously. Of course it, it just, was a sanctuary. It wasn't a Motel 6. No, it was ceremonial. That um, was absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> where's where, where's my statue with the big boobs? Exactly. Well, she's somewhere around here. Uh, there's um, always a fertility goddess. Show me the fertility goddess. Always. Um, I would say on this, just it. So when <laughs> I was here, you get I got to go down. Most people don't get to go down and walk down into the actual well itself. There's still water down there, or at least there was in the nineties when seen I was it. there. I've seen in videos. I mean, uh, Hugh Newman's. I've seen his some of his stuff. And uh, I think we passed him in the in the search here. I think uh, what's Anthony? Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Andrew Collins. Andrew Collins. Was it Andrew Collins? Yes, yeah. it was Andrew Collins. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry, Andrew. I don't know Andrew. I don't. I've only met Hugh a couple times, but I mean they they they've done videos right down to the well. But again, this looks like a bunker. This thing looks so well manufactured. And again, the rock wall behind it is very unique in that it seems to identify polygonal blocks that have just been weathered and moved or not in their original locations. But, but yeah, and I think that this in particular, you know, we talked about like uh, chisel marks or marks that exist on stones that have been worked with, you know, uh, less sophisticated implements. I, I can't tell you that I ever saw any marks on this. And I looked at my pictures over the course of the years, and I've never seen any chisel marks on the rocks in or around any of the stuff that I excavated. So I, I find that very curious because even when we were in Egypt, you know, there were times when I'd be like, oh, well, you can see the marks here. When I, when I was in Petra or in Jordan, you can see marks where tools have been used. I just don't see that on this. And I, I, I find that really, that's very interesting to me. That's definitely something to take note of. It's just so well done. And even looking at, okay, well, they finished the facade really well, but they didn't finish yeah. the back of the block. Half of me wonders if the soil around the excavation is also not a, like the, it was not on a ground. That I, it almost looks like everything around it has been built up. And that the even the edging, how the back sides of the megalithic uh, well hewn granite is almost decorative here. Yeah. It's almost they, intentional. Yeah. And I wonder, yeah, I'll have to look back in my pictures to see who, if they've modified it in any way. I mean, modern modification. I don't believe that this particular well has been modified. I know that there are some others on the islands that they have. Um, Did, have you been able to see any of it deconstructed? I have seen a couple of the, the structures deconstructed. I think that this one has always been intact just because it's subterranean. I don't think that they ever had to really do anything with this one. I don't think it's shored up either. I mean, I know that there's a, a spring underneath this, a natural spring. Actually, there are a number of natural springs on the island, which is also an interesting thing just to keep in mind as well. That's not particularly common, I guess I should say. No, um, and, and imagining this more connected with other places around it, including mainland Italy, maybe, or, you know, just it just doesn't seem there's those weird like Victor Schauberger's work, uh, the naturalist slash kind of quantum philosopher slash vortex experimenter he you know he's the guy who figured out how to how even one degree in water makes a difference if you're going to create log flumes at work and his observations about the natural world with water with a small uh shack in austria that was removed that was supposed to be a water area dating almost to roman times and when they removed the shack there was no more spring the spring stopped oh wow and, and then uh, this is in the early, early 1900s. This is pre-World War II. 
And what happened was, is they replaced the shack and the spring came back. 